FX's Atlanta is a scripted series created and starring Donald Glover. If you've seen the series finale, you could describe it as Black Culture Inception. But before we talk about the ending, we have got to start at the beginning. Glover was a main character on the ensemble cast of the popular NBC sitcom Community, but he left the show early in the fifth season to develop Atlanta. Departures like this have become a recurring theme in Glover's career. As an NYU student, he caught the attention of Tina Fey through his collaborations on the up-and-coming YouTube channel Derek Comedy, and he landed a writing gig on 30 Rock, thanks in part to a diverse hire program established by NBC. So Glover left Derek Comedy to work on 30 Rock, left 30 Rock to work on Community, and left Community to start Atlanta. And as Atlanta has made its ascent as one of the best shows on television, Glover's found a multitude of opportunities, including starring roles in Spider-Man, Star Wars, Guava Island, which is an Amazon original film with Rihanna, and an upcoming Mr. and Mrs. Smith reimagining, just to name a few. Donald keeps evolving when most people would get comfortable, and dare I say stagnant. The creation of Atlanta is also a testament to Glover's creative fearlessness. He has stated in interviews that he had to Trojan horse the series, meaning what he originally pitched to FX executives was very different from the show we've come to know. In fact, they were expecting something a lot like Community, a quirky, irreverent comedy about two black men navigating the rap industry that could go on for several seasons. Darius was just supposed to be the comic relief. But Atlanta is not that at all. Glover went out of his way to break all the conventions of television with Atlanta. It is not a serialized show. The episodes are mostly self-contained with plots and storylines that don't necessarily continue the next week or ever again. Ibra Brake, a writer on Atlanta, shared a screen grab of notes from day one in the writer's room back in 2015. A line that stands out is this. We should be able to say certain things and not have the audience understand right away. The audience should learn rather than being explained to. You can see Donald was very intentional about how he wanted to tell this story. The story of Atlanta follows Ern, played by Donald Glover, and Al, played by Brian Tyree Henry. Ern and Al are cousins. Al's mom, Lorraine, and Ern's mom, Gloria, are very close sisters. So by extension, Al and Ern spent a lot of their youth together. Al and Ern's other aunts and uncles are Pearl, Jeannie, and Uncle Willie, AKA the Alligator Man, played by Cat Williams. Al's relationship with Ern is almost that of a big brother, as Al is often having to save Ern. The earliest example we see of this in the show is from grade school, when Ern potentially has a fake FUBU jersey, and Al saves Ern from school-wide ridicule, but at the expense of another student with a similar FUBU jersey on, who ends up dying by suicide due to the bullying and his problems at home. Now, Ern is an exceptional student and eventually gets accepted to Princeton, while Al becomes a full-time drug dealer. In the years to follow, both of them deal with life-changing events as Al's mom Lorraine passes away and Ern is expelled from Princeton. A rift grows between the once inseparable cousins because of what each of them are dealing with. Ern is scarred from his experience at Princeton, which he keeps his family in the dark about. Al's Princeton, by the way, still not y'all. Three years along, y'all. I think I know what happened. I really think you don't. Al? harbors hard feelings toward Ern because they haven't spoken since his mother's funeral. At some point, Ern gets into a relationship with Vanessa, or Van, played by Zazie Beetz. Van and Ern have a child together named Lottie. Though the relationship between Ern and Van has moments of love and passion, the ongoing issue for them is Ern's lack of commitment and support for their child. They are in more of a situationship than an actual relationship. And Ern is working dead-end jobs in the aftermath of his Princeton expulsion and he's unable to support Van and Lottie financially. A coworker puts Ern onto a hit song by a new rapper named Paperboy, and he's shocked to learn that Paperboy is his cousin Al. Paperboy's postal mixtape blows up and he's the hottest rapper in the streets. Ern sees this as an opportunity and approaches Al offering to be his manager. But Al questions Ern's intentions and his aptitude for managing a rapper. You know where the word manage come from? Manus, Latin for hand. Probably, but I'm gonna say no for the purpose of my argument. Manage. Come from the word man, and uh, that ain't really your lane. So, in order to prove himself to Al, Ern successfully gets Paperboy's song played on the radio. But there is little time to celebrate as an altercation quickly ensues, and Paperboy is arrested for shooting the man who confronted him, and Ern is arrested for marijuana possession. Now, to round out this group, we also meet Al's closest friend and confidant, Darius Easy, who can't have children because his balls were smashed as a kid in Nigeria. Don't ask. So Darius is the quirky one of the group. 
Originally pitched as the comic relief to counter Alan Earn, his character is far more than that simplified trope, and his first line of dialogue in the series could be a revelation as to the meaning of the entire show. Hold on, hold on, man. I'm getting crazy deja vu right now. Okay, where's the dog with the Texas on him? Oh, there he is. That's a trip. Al, aka Paperboy, continues his ascent into the rap game with the trusted Darius by his side. The shooting incident boosts Paperboy's street cred, but it looms over both him and Earn as the former is on house arrest and the latter is on probation. Earn continues trying to prove himself to Al and books Paperboy for several lower level opportunities, including a celebrity basketball game featuring a black Justin Bieber, a talk show appearance on the fictional Black American Network, and club appearances, including one where the promoter tries every trick to avoid paying, and Al is forced to take matters into his own hands, which eventually adds to his legal troubles. Side note, the club is also where we see the invisible car mow over pedestrians, one of Atlanta's most memorable surrealist moments. Now, the surrealism is ramped up to 11, where fantastical, nonsensical, or impossible situations occur in this grounded world of Atlanta. The aforementioned Black Justin Bieber and the fictional commercials that ran on the BAN network, as well as the documentary The Goof Who Sat By The Door, are just a few examples of the show experimenting with our perceptions of what's real and what's fantasy. The vast majority of these dreamlike scenarios are associated with Darius, but not all. In the very first episode, we hear Earn describe a recurring dream to Van, a dream we would eventually witness in the season three premiere episode, Three Slaps. Since you were eight, you always had a dream where you were swimming and below are hands grasping to reach you. You fight to stay free. Why are you so certain the hands intend to harm you? Paperboy's buzz continues growing and he is invited to tour with rapper Senator K. And though they witness a police shooting, the day is ultimately a win for Al and Earn and their fractured relationship. Al starts to trust Earn as a manager and gives him 8% of his earnings, which he gives to Vanessa to help repair that rift. She's wanted Earn to be a more present father and this is a step in the right direction. I hate you. I know. <sighs> You're a good daddy. Season one of Atlanta concludes with us finding out that Earn has been living in a storage unit. And season two, Robin season, picks up with Earn being kicked out of a storage unit. He tries to crash at Al's, but his friend Tracy, who just got out of the joint, is staying there now and has become a complete wrench in the chemistry between Al, Earn, and Darius. Because not only are Al and Earn cousins, but Darius and Earn have grown close through their adventures together. So Tracy feels like an interloper and an obstacle in his goal of managing Paperboy's rap career. Al, upon seeing some of the opportunities afforded to other celebrities in his position, begins to grow impatient with Earn's progress and prowess as a manager. He also has people in his ear sowing doubts about if having his cousin manage him is the smartest career move. It all comes to a head as Al, Earn, Darius, and Tracy, who force his way on the trip as security, attend a college pajama jam. Paperboy and his fellow Atlanta rapper Clark County both perform. Earn has them staying with an overzealous fan for free. Meanwhile, Clark County is given more money and better accommodations. They're eventually chased off campus when Tracy assaults a student and Al threatens to fire Earn for his lack of managerial accountability. Earn is visibly frustrated and blames Tracy for the trip falling apart. He challenges him to a fight, but that doesn't work out for Earn. So Paperboy is invited on Clark County's European tour. It's his first time leaving Georgia, but at the airport, Earn forgets he had a gun given to him by Uncle Willie in his bag. He plants the gun on Clark County, but Clark makes his manager take the rap and he gets arrested while Clark, Paperboy, Al, and Darius make their way to Europe without issue. Earn's decision to put himself and Al first, despite how devious it may have been, shows a change in his MO. Earn steps up in order to provide Paperboy with the level of managerial services he needs to succeed, and we begin to see a more ruthless and callous version of Earn take shape. Van and Earn's relationship becomes more financially stable, yet more ambiguous. The co-parenting arrangement seems to be working out, but Van makes it clear that she doesn't want to fuck Buddy. But Earn doesn't express a clear vision for what he wants out of their relationship. I want to be 
in a committed relationship where I'm valued as a human being and not as an accessory that you can fuck. I don't know what I want. I, I know this arrangement works for me. In somewhat of a dark nod to love and basketball, Ern and Vanessa play a table tennis game to determine the fate of their relationship in the Helen episode. Van wins and their romance is effectively ended, at least for now. Vanessa eventually makes her way to Europe to join the boys on their second European tour. Ern has definitely stepped up his manager game, as he has a good handle on Paperboy, but still falls short when it comes to Vanessa. His phone dies and he oversleeps in the room of some random white woman while Van is landing in Amsterdam. He calls Darius to pick up Van and she reveals that she now has a boyfriend, which may or may not be true, because Van has been dissociating. She's had dark feelings about herself and motherhood and decides to adopt a new personality completely while in Europe. Van has all sorts of surreal adventures, including a domineering relationship with Alexander Skarsgård and aggravated assault with a stale baguette. She's eventually snapped out of her dissociation when she runs into her friend Candace, the same friend that got them into the Drake mansion in Robin season. Meanwhile, in Europe, the fellas engage in their own surreal adventures, including a trip to a billionaire's house with its own Nando's and a tree that Al cuts down. A team of black influencers attempt to end racism forever after a brand's racist fashion faux pas. And Al takes a hallucinogenic drug where he trips with a trans woman named Lorraine, the same name as his mom. Lorraine questions Al about the people around him and if they truly have his best interests at heart. And when sober, he asks Ern who owns his masters prompted by a line of questioning from Lorraine. When Ern tells Al that he owns his own masters, this feels like the conclusion of this arc between the two cousins. Ern has proven to Al tenfold that he is more than equipped to manage him, and Al no longer questions his cousin's abilities. Though Ern does still seem distant, and the familiarity that they once shared as friends and not business associates erodes. Now back in Atlanta, Ern is delivered a bag that was supposedly lost while traveling. But Ern isn't missing any bags. And when he opens the suitcase, he sees personal items and a family photo of a white man named Ernest, who was featured in two season three standalone episodes. And he was missing his luggage in those episodes. These standalone stories were believed to be self-contained outside of the universe with Paperboy Darius and or Ernst Dreams. However, this post credit scene puts that theory into question. With the final season of the series, our main characters are back in Atlanta. They've achieved financial stability thanks to Al's success in the music industry. Every one of them has had a glow up, but Ern is still troubled by unconfronted feelings from his Princeton expulsion. He is starting to have heart troubles and tightness in his chest. He starts therapy at the recommendation of his doctor, and it's in these sessions that we as the audience find out why he was expelled from Princeton. You can click on the video above if you want the detailed account of why Ern was expelled. But to sum it up, he was betrayed by a friend that he trusted. Ern's trust issues bring up memories of past abuse, and it's revealed that Ern was abused by a family member. The exact kind of abuse isn't specified, but Ern breaks into tears at the mention of it. Ern also reveals in therapy that he received a job offer in LA and wants Van and Lottie to move out of Atlanta and come with him. He admits to being worried about the distance between himself and his daughter if Van decides not to go. Now a success story, Ern is invited to speak at Princeton, and he even negotiates an honorary degree. He arranges to go back to the university to accept his honor, along with a trip to Sesame Place with Van and Lottie. But an overzealous white woman, <coughs> Karen, <coughs> at the airport, prevents them from boarding the flight and ruins the trip for them. So Ern plans a premeditated revenge attack on the woman, and preemptively ends therapy while he enacts his plan. Darius and Al are somewhat horrified at the lengths Ern is willing to go for revenge. I can't tell if this is extreme, extreme pettiness or terrorism. Great job. Ern rents out an entire campground for Lottie's birthday and uses it as an opportunity to discuss the move to LA with Van. Van is apprehensive to uproot her whole life for Ern who isn't necessarily committed or clear about the definition of their relationship. She doesn't want to be his security blanket in a new city, but Ern dismisses the idea that he needs a security blanket. Ern admits his love for Van, not just as Lottie's mom, but he tearfully declares his love and desire for her. He knows he can find someone new, but says he loves Van and doesn't want to. He wants them to be a family. Van ultimately agrees to move with him to LA. After years of friction over the definition of their relationship, 
Earn finally seems ready to commit to his family. Now in Paperboy's world, he's enjoying the spoils of his rap success, but is forced to come to terms with the fact that he is no longer the hot and up and coming act. He attends a seminar with other rappers and learns about YWA, young white avatars, buzzy white rappers who are appropriating the culture but have potential for a mainstream fan base. Al learns the art of managing and ultimately cashing in on these YWAs as a wealth building tactic. However, his YWA, Yodel Kid, dies of an overdose before Al is able to fully exploit him. He wins a posthumous Grammy. Financially set and ready to settle down, Al buys a farm at the recommendation of fellow rapper Soldier Boy. Soldier escaped to his safe farm when the crank that killer was on the loose. Though isolated and faced with some dangerous predicaments, Al seems to enjoy the peace and serenity of the farm life. The non-serialized stories for each of our characters reach their conclusions. Van and Ern are moving to LA, and Al is moving to his safe farm. It's the POV of Darius that dominates the final episode of Atlanta. Darius has always had a different grip on reality than the rest of the characters. As mentioned before, many of the surreal moments of the show happen to or around Darius. One notable example is the Teddy Perkins episode where Darius narrowly escapes with his life. He stated in the Champagne Poppy episode his belief in simulation theory. Have you heard of Bodstrom's simulation argument? No. And basically, it just states that uh, future civilizations must have immense computing power. And that if even a fraction of this were to run ancestral simulation, there's a high probability that it would be indistinguishable from reality to the simulated ancestor, i.e. us. What? Your simulation. <sighs> In the series finale, Darius goes to a sensory deprivation tank before meeting up with Al, Ern, and Van at a new Black-owned sushi restaurant. Now, while in the tank, Darius experiences several scenarios that are indistinguishable from dreams and what we're actually seeing as the viewer. Darius can lose track of what is real and what is a dream while in the tank, so he has an anchor to keep him grounded, thinking about thick Judge Judy. Since Judge Judy is always on TV, he uses her figure to determine if he's in reality or a dream. So if Judge Judy looks thick, he knows he's still in the tank. If this concept sounds familiar, it's because it is. Inception had the same premise. In Inception, characters unable to distinguish between the dream world and the real world used a totem or an anchor to differentiate between the two. Now, the final scene of the entire Atlanta series even ends in a similar fashion to Inception. Darius is staring at his anchor to determine if he's in fact dreaming or not, and the answer is left up to us, the audience, to interpret. And that is how Four Seasons of Atlanta ends. But what does it all mean? Was the entire series Darius's dream? There are no definitive answers, but we can speculate based on the information the show has presented us and Donald Glover's intentions when originally creating the show. You'll recall Donald had to quote unquote Trojan horse the show onto the air. As we mentioned earlier, he pitched it to the network as a community-like sitcom where we follow Alan Ern's struggles through the music industry. Once on the air, Donald unapologetically made the show he wanted to make. What we ended up getting was an African-American Deja Rev series. Now, what is Deja Rev? It's okay if you don't know. I've only recently learned about it myself. Deja Rev translates in English as already dreamed, a cousin of Deja Vu, which translates to already seen. Deja Rev is a loaded concept and there are three types. The type of Deja Rev that most accurately describes Atlanta is the dreamy state version. This kind of Deja Rev is described as the feeling of being in a dream. Scenarios in your real life feel and or remind you of dreams you've had and your waking life and dream life are virtually indistinguishable. I don't think that there's a term or a concept that better describes Atlanta. The moments of surrealism that have become the trademark of the show can all be classified as deja vu. Al's trek through the woods, his hallucinogenic trip in Amsterdam, the spirit of his dead mother complaining about his cleaning habits, all of these could be dreamlike realities or realistic dreams. Vanessa's identity crisis and Ern's recurring dream about black hands pulling him down also fit nicely into Atlanta's Deja Rev. And what about the standalone stories from season three? Originally speculated to be all Ern's dream, these scenarios blur the line between dreams and reality when Ern receives a photo of his white counterpart. And finally, we have to wrap things up with Darius, because one could interpret the entire series as simply a concoction of Darius's mind. Maybe it's just uh, my dream, and you were just in it. Always have been.
However, that would dismiss the lessons learned and miles traveled by our other characters. What seems more reasonable is that the entire series is a deja rev or waking dream for all of our characters. The invisible cars, black Justin Bieber's, and all the surrealism of Atlanta don't exist only in one single character's dream. The adventures experienced in Atlanta have been a collective waking dream for Ern, Al, Van, and of course, Darius. At least that's what we think. But what do you think? Was the series all just Darius's dream? Did he really steal that pink Maserati in real life? Or was Darius's smile at the end a smile of relief, knowing that he won't catch a Grand Theft Auto charge? Do you agree that Atlanta is Donald Glover's take on Inception, Twin Peaks, Deja Rev? Or do you have another theory entirely? Let us know what you think in the comments, and thanks for joining us on this surreal adventure through all four seasons of Atlanta. We'll continue to release more Atlanta videos, as the series has left us with many thoughts and topics yet to be explored. So be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out. And thanks again for watching both on FIVS.